sat there. You know, the more intellectual you are, the more intelligent you think you are, the odds are you're going to look at the word faith and go, no standard. Huh? We have that problem. The more intelligent we are, the more intellectual we think we are, or the more intelligent we think we are, we are not going to be very... We will not take this word sadda very seriously. We think that it is a condition that the rest of the world needs, but not us, because we are so... We are thinkers. We are the people who use our mind and our brain to logically work through things. So we don't need faith. Sometimes we have that problem. Oddly, for someone like Buddha, who was possibly one of the greatest thinkers, definitely of his time, possibly of all times, one of the smartest people around, he told us, he said, Sadda is a critical quality without which not possible to see the Dhamma. So there lies a little bit of a contradiction, you know, or a little bit of a dilemma, not contradiction, a little bit of a dilemma for us. If we are so intelligent and we are so intellectual and we are thinkers and we use our minds so logically, how do we build faith? What does this faith mean for us? Now, we know the word sadda literally means having faith or having confidence. Believing in something intrinsically, implicitly. You believe in something implicitly. We take it at literally face value and we run with it. That's the idea. Having sadda means believing in something implicitly. You don't ask too many questions and you just do as said. Then you say, eh, hello, isn't Buddhism not quite like this? We're supposed to think, we're supposed to reflect. Indeed, that's true. Having faith in what? Having faith must have faith in something. Okay? The first one is having faith in the Buddha. But in what sense? Very simply, that Buddha, as a human, as a teacher, as a historical personality, existed. More importantly, he was enlightened. That he enlightened, being enlightened means having knowledge, a certain special type of knowledge that made it possible for him to find a solution to the question he posed. If you recall, what was that question that he wanted resolved? If you recall. Dukkha and the way out. <laughs> Lecture one. The question he posed was, what is Dukkha? How do we get out? How do we resolve the pain and the Dukkha in our minds? And when we say he was enlightened, it meant that he had the knowledge, we believe he had the answer to his own question. His own question. So he knew, therefore, he had the answer to happiness, to a happy mind, content, peaceful, unconditioned bliss. He knew how to do it. He knew what it was like. So he knew not just the number two and number three are not the same. You may think they are the same. No, that you know the answer doesn't, know, doesn't mean you know how to teach. That you know the answer doesn't, know, doesn't mean you can teach effectively. So we believe he knew the answer. We believe he knew what he was teaching and he was good at what he did. And we believe that the knowledge, if you understand, would deliver the Nibbana, 
the unconditioned release that he said it would. So there are parts to it. This person existed, he was enlightened, he knew what he was teaching, he could teach that to you, and the Dhamma works. You must believe that. Okay? If you don't believe any of this, any of this, then your start point means a shaky sutta. And, you know, we cannot assume that you believe this. Huh? There will be moments in your practice, possible moments in your practice, possible moments in your life, when you actually ask, true or not? Buddha really enlightened. Huh? Seriously, huh? Dhamma like that. Sure or not? Hey, in the first place, uh, was there such a man? Uh? You don't bluff me. I know for some of you, probably in your mind, this kind of questions can float up. The question is, is it wrong? No, it's not wrong. It's perfectly fine to ask. Perfectly fine to have these sort of questions floating up. Okay? Perfectly okay. Because until you really see the Dhamma, your faith, your sattva, is never that strong anyway. So at this stage, at this stage before you've seen Dhamma, at this stage, perfectly fine to ask all kinds of questions. And it is not a scene to ask. No bad karma to ask. No scared about the merit points. Okay, my mind uh, got one question. Uh, is it Buddha real or not? But they're not asked. If I ask already, I should cannot go back. Come out. No such thing. Okay, it's perfectly all right to to pose questions now. Even during the Buddha's time, there were suttas where he says, "Okay, ask, ask about me." Okay, faith in Dhamma, that that the Dhamma works. that the Dhamma is truth that can be experienced, that it can be tasted within this life, and that there is such a thing as Nibbana, unconditioned bliss. Now, Dhamma, two parts to it. There is the part of Dhamma that describes the steps, the methods to achieving the state of mind for Nibbana. That's the steps. That's why it says that it works. There are steps to practice, to follow. Do you want to do it? Are you prepared to embrace the steps? Embark on this journey. And then there is the end of the journey, the destination. The destination is Nibbana. Do you believe in Nibbana? Do you believe it's possible to have a state where there is no more arising of craving and that the mind can go into a state of unconditioned bliss. Do you believe that? So there are different parts of the Dhamma. Dhamma is not just one concept with one generic thing and it's kind of neon lights, you know, with a halo. Dhamma is a real, it's, it's a method, a methodology of a practice, of a path. A journey. Do you believe that there is such a thing as these are the steps? Does it really work? Can I do it? That's the second part. Huh? There is the step, there is the destination, and then there's the other part which is, can I do it? That's why it says here, it can be tasted in this life. The problem for a lot of people is they don't exactly doubt Dhamma. I use the word not exactly. Because sometimes it's 50-50, you don't know whether to believe or not, okay? So they don't exactly doubt Dhamma, but they doubt themselves. Because they say that Dhamma, well, very difficult, you know, can't be done. Eh? Well, it's not for me, lah. maybe for you, for you it can be done. So everyone says it's possible for the other person, but not for him. That in itself is a problem. You must believe, if you believe that it works, and you believe that it can be experienced, and you believe that Dimbana is there, but not for me, 
Then what are you saying? You're slower than everyone else. Or that Dharma is so difficult, and if I'm common, that means I'm national average, then uh, it must be very tough. Then you're almost saying that the method doesn't work. You, you see what I'm saying? If you say it, it can work, but not for me, it's either you're very slow, above national average slow, <laughs> or no, you're not slow, but it is so tough, it generally doesn't work. It cannot, cannot happen. In which case, then you doubt Dhamma. You see the, the, this logic here? So, not so straightforward. Okay? I have, I have people who come to me and say, I have absolute faith in the triple gem. I have people who said that to me, I have absolute faith in the triple gem. And then when you start to poke, and ask questions, what exactly do you mean? That's where they crumble. Because that faith, I've absolute faith in the triple gem, the odds are, it's one of those that says, I blindly follow whatever you say, but I have no idea what you're saying. Okay? That's the problem. I blindly follow what you say, but I don't know what you're saying. But it's okay, I'm blind anyway. <laughs> Not like that. Okay? Not like this for Dhamma. Okay, we move on. Buddha, you can close your eyes and then say, I absolutely believe. Dhamma, you say, well, Buddha thought that, right? I dare not ask questions, I believe. Sangha? This are, what is a Sangha? First, let's define this term, Sangha. What do you understand by the word Sangha? Community or practitioner, usually we take that to mean the monks, okay? Generally, we take that word, Sangha, to mean monks. It actually means gathering, group, together, okay? Uh, in the time of the Buddha, when he used the word Sangha, he did mean the monks, practitioner monks, practitioner monks. And again and again, Buddha had made the point that it is not just wearing the robe that makes you a Sangha member, the monk, a bhikkhu, it is the practice. Embracing the conduct, the training rules, honouring and walking, the, doing the training rules, practicing it properly, having a mind fixed on Nibbana, the practice and the walking towards Nibbana, conscientiously, sincerely. Okay? Another way he had used it is to talk about the people who had actually experienced, seen the path, experienced the fruits, the eight kinds of individual, as he puts it, the sotapana, sakadagami, anagami, arahata. The, that's his other manner of explaining what's a sangha. Now, having faith in sangha, what does it mean? It means the belief that there are Arya Sangha and true practitioners and they are the living embodiments of Dhamma. Living proof that the path delivers as promised. You see living examples of people who walk the path, practice it, realize it, and you believe it can be done. There are such people. If you don't believe that there are living ev evidence of Dhamma, proof that Dhamma works, then it's very difficult for you to believe that Dhamma actually works. Because Dhamma is difficult to understand, difficult to see. And if it is so difficult to understand and so difficult to see, then how do you know that it works? So these two, Dhamma and Sangha, actually are linked. They are actually linked. You believe that Dharma works, you must believe there are living examples of practitioners who have seen it. Okay? Now, before I go on, huh? having explained what is faith in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, how many of you would now declare that you have Sangha? You, you saw the explanation, right? What is 
faith in Buddha, what is faith in Dhamma Sangha? How many of you would openly declare that you have sadha? Well, suddenly no more. <laughs> yeah, you still must have, ma. What has changed? The only thing that has changed is a bit more under explanation on what's Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Suddenly all the hands disappear. No, you're all no faith, eh? Sadda, as a mental state, has to be understood at two levels, okay? There is such a thing called the faith of a new convert and the faith of a practitioner. Sadda, as applied in the two cases, is not the same. Remember that. As applied, sadda for a new convert and sadda for a practitioner, that sadda the element, what it does for them, what it does to their mind, not the same. Doesn't have the same impact. Okay? What does it mean by the sadda of a new convert? First and foremost, sadda in Buddhism is not blind faith. It's, what is blind faith? Blind faith is, you don't ask questions, you just do, just don't think, just believe. Whatever I say, you just believe. In Buddhism, it doesn't work like this. In Buddhism, faith has to be developed as a result of having some basic knowledge about the doctrine and the practice. Let me explain this. Huh? It's always said in Buddhism, Buddha has always said, having sadha in the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, he always said that. Then you go, I have, I can even memorize them in Pali and Chinese and English and so on and so forth. That's not basic understanding. Basic understanding is what we have been saying in the past weeks. I have said time and again, you accept that there is such a thing as dukkha. You acknowledge that in life, you experience dukkha. And the reason why you have all these sensations of dukkha is because you have all these cravings. Again and again and again, relentlessly. And you believe that if you can learn to moderate your cravings, your sensations of dukkha, your sense of dukkha should diminish. And you believe it can be done. That's having basic, basic understanding of Dhamma. This is how basic it gets. Now, Buddha had said, and I always say this, he tells people, you come, you sit, you listen. Listen, the word listen is to give attention to what he has to say. And then you reflect and you compare it according to your own experience. Now let me just explain a little bit more. Huh? Let me explain a little bit more. The word come, to you it may sound like just go forward. It's not. Huh? To come is to make a choice. You have to choose to go. When he says you come, it doesn't mean you will just go. You must want it. For some of us, you actually have to make effort, like take a bus, take MRT, drive, walk to wherever. And then after you have been there, it doesn't mean you will stay to hear things. How many of us have brought people to temples, monasteries, indeed, whatever places of worship? Fellow goes, fellow see, fellow leaves. <laughs> Every step has a choice. You have to choose to go. Sometimes you go because your boyfriend left. I mean, he went there, you follow. Lah. Sometimes you go because your parents are there. What to do? Parents want to go, I go law. So when he says come, it's a choice. You make a choice to go. But you must also make a choice to hang around. You can go show face and that's it. Or you can go and the word here is sit. Nisi dati, sit. To sit is a big decision. Why? Means you're prepared to commit time. It means you're prepared to hear something. Or at least you're prepared to spend time. Okay, you only got 24 hours, right? How many of you got 26 hours? I want your life. 
<laughs> so you only got 24 hours. It means that you are making a decision of a zero-sum game here. I choose to go. I choose to stay around. And once you sit, uh, you're committed. Because how many of you uh, have, in the middle of a talk, stand up to leave? Be shy. La. You think the whole world's watching you, but actually nobody's watching you. La. When you're very shy, right? you've got to stand up and leave. So once you sit, you're actually there. Luck. For a while, huh? for a while. Until the nature's call, very strong, then you boop, you must go. Otherwise, you're just going to stay until the end, right? Third, that you are sitting down there doesn't mean you are hearing me. Huh? <laughs> Everybody knows that. That you are sitting down there, it merely means I have one more person occupying a space. So your form is here. Your mind, only you know. I don't know. Okay? So the Buddha, look at how he breaks it down. You just look at how Buddha breaks it down. He says, you come, you sit, and you better listen. Pay attention. Actually, sometimes he even breaks it into two parts. Huh? Give ear. Listen. Sometimes that word doesn't appear, sometimes it appears. Meaning to say, you put your attention on the hearing consciousness and hear what he says. You see how he breaks down this part? How many of us actually look at the mind to that level of gradation? Granularity. How many of us do that? He breaks it down to that level. Then after you have listened, you must reflect. To reflect and to compare makes you a proactive listener. Otherwise, you are only a passive listener. And when you are a passive listener, you don't learn. It's when you are a proactive listener, then, then you're internalizing the message. So here, the Buddha, every step of the way, these are not just words, and these are not just activities and verbs. These, every one of them has a deeper meaning. There are implications. Every step of the way, you make a choice. You are in entire control of the learning process. You have to go, you have to sit, you have to listen, and now you see whether you like what you hear, you compare. Compare and reflect on it. So, to listen to the Buddha, for a new convert, someone who is new, the expectation of you is don't just buy a product without paying attention to the details. You have to listen to him, hear the Dhamma, see if the doctrine tallies with your life's experiences, and only then you get started. Two-part process. Three parts if you like. You can break it down to two parts, you can break it down to three parts. What do I mean? Part one requires that you understand your options, what you are buying, what you are digesting. Part two asks you to think about whether or not he makes sense. This is one teacher who wants you to think for yourself. And then if you think that he makes a lot of sense, then now are you prepared to commit yourself? Commitment, the practice. So there is no room for don't think, follow exactly what I say. There's no room for that. There is absolute thinking. So now I'm going to explain to you again, uh, just giving it to you. Faith. Faith in our in Buddhism. Faith means to think because you are supposed to hear and reflect. You have to think first. Know what you are doing. Understand what you are digesting. Understand what you are digesting. 
Understand what you are hearing, in other words. After you have heard and understood, then, then you think about choices. Do I practice or do I not practice? If I were to practice, what do I do? What should I do? What else should I do? And when you're making choices like that, you are reflecting on options, right? You're weighing options. So, critical judgments. Very high level thinking going on. High order intellectual exercise. Very high level thinking. Let me summarize the, 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 the process again. What's the difference? Huh? And then just see if you can follow what I'm saying. The first step requires you to listen to the Dhamma. Just listen. Suspend your critical judgment. Suspend your tendency to say, is it me? Suspend all those things. Just listen. To get a mind to a state where you don't make judgment and just listen first. That is choice. And that part also requires you to know that your mind is doing that. My mind is suspending judgment and just being open-minded, not critical, and paying attention to the data. In itself, this in itself is not easy. You think it's easy, but this is not easy. I tell you why. I'll give you an example and i prove to you that it's not easy. Um, when was the last time someone was complaining to you about their life? Ah, last night, not last night. <laughs> or yesterday, like yesterday. Eh? When was the last time someone was complaining to you about something, complaining to you about their life? Probably not too far back, eh? because we are always complaining. Ma. All you need to just sit somewhere and someone will come up to you and complain. Okay? How much of what he said did you hear? Or were you also making judgment as you listen? He, she says something to the effect that he say me, and then you say, yeah, I also say you. <laughs> he said, I do fair. I agree with him, you know, I agree with him. <laughs> Watch your mind adding its own commentary. We very rarely listen well. Okay, maybe it's a too strong a word. We do have a tendency not to listen very well because we are so critical. We have a lot of things to say. Yeah? So, asking you to hear, be open-minded, don't make judgment, just gather the facts, is not easy. You see that? So he's not asking you to do something very easy. Just hear. Then you, I hear. It's not that easy. Okay? Then comes this part. He says, now, now that you have heard and assuming that you were a good fellow, you know, you're a very good student, you heard properly, so you digested the material. Now, can you remember? Because he asks you to reflect. Before you can reflect, you must remember. So there's a second part unsaid is, can you remember? And the odds are, given our very hectic lifestyle, we we're also busy, right? We don't remember a lot. How many of you, when you finish one talk like this, you go off and you retain 90% <laughs> without the YouTube assistance? 80? 70? 50? If I go down to 40, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> Not a very good heart to begin with, you know, very sad one eh? Seriously, 40%? Are you shy or not? <laughs> down to 10%. We know we need that YouTube up quickly. Okay. But seriously, you have to remember. If you don't remember how to reflect, now I don't have to ask you to reflect. How to reflect, you know, only got 20% left. The part that this is, believe in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, I don't remember everything else. <laughs> okay. So you have to remember, and then you can reflect. Okay? And then after you have reflected, this is not easier. You think about it. 
How many of you have, you would agree with me, would agree with me that after reflection, we come up with different answers, right? Your husband and you go somewhere, heard something, both reflected, both got different answers. Two versions. You bring along your family, five of you, go somewhere, listen to something, five versions. What kind of a reflection is going on? Because it's about individual's judgment. So that you reflect that doesn't mean you're correct, you will understand correctly and so on and so forth. So there's a lot, a lot of intellectual thing going on. It is with the, in Buddhism, it is true initially an intellectual understanding of Dhamma first before that faith grows. What do I mean by that? Remember what I said about the Four Noble Truths? Dukkha, craving and the correlation with Dukkha being able to moderate and then it feels better. And the last bit is, do you believe that there's a method that will help you to achieve that? If you can understand this, and it's, well, this is very intellectual understanding, if it makes sense to you, then you can say, I have some degree of sadha. And you keep looking at these these sensations in the mind, then you will find that, okay, the more I see the correlation between craving and dukkha and moderation and bliss, the more I keep seeing the correlation, the more I believe the Buddha was right. The faith grows straight away. Buddha's right, Dhamma's correct, Sangha will see. But Buddha and Dhamma, the faith will grow. Now, if indeed you are beginning to have sadda, faith in Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, you're beginning to have that, there's some implications, you know. You will change. Your attitude will change. Your perspective will start to change. Even if you are, as I call you, a newly minted convert. This is a Buddhist who understands. This is not a Buddhist who goes and bow at the temple only. That one has no understanding. That one, the faith is shaky, can transfer one, it's transferable. Okay? This one is not yet completely non transferable, not yet, but it's beginning to get there. Because when this individual say, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a student of Dhamma, when he said this, he said it with understanding, with knowledge, with intellectual acceptance of the doctrine already. It's much harder to convince someone he was wrong after he had thought true. It's so much easier to tell him you're wrong when he didn't think. He just feel. You feel, can change feelings. Think through, tougher to change his mind. Okay? So that's why up to this point, if you got it right, it's harder to change. Your faith will grow. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the result of you understanding the correlation between dukkha, craving, moderation, and Belief, uh, relief, the result of that is surely in your daily life you must learn to moderate expectations. Surely. If you tell me even this one you didn't manage to do, then I would tell you, I think it's time to go for a retreat. <laughs> this, is the, this is the easiest part, you know, just moderate. I didn't even ask you to let go yet, let. By the way, uh, we all have understanding. Uh, in this forum, when we use the word let go, it means to let be. Not to let go. Uh. <laughs> Agreement, okay? So it's just letting be, okay? It's just letting be. You may. And the other one is, if you are a Buddhist, then you surely must believe in and if you believe in karma, you must surely 
want to exercise restraints. It's all logical. If you tell me that I believe in karma, then you start scolding people, scolding people. Which karma you believe in? Huh? The Buddha's karma or your own version that says, I have immunity. You will start to, in your mind, realize that morality is not an option. I say it is a given. What I mean is, you begin to accept that it is necessary. I have to do it. I have no choice. What does it mean? You see, if you start to see your mind as something that can change, and that's something that can pick up bad habits, or pick up good habits, it can change. You start to see that. Then you must start to understand or start to realize that I can keep staining it, or you take this mind and keep dunking it into mud. Keep dunking it into mud. And after a while, you take it out, what happened? Mud lah! <laughs> it will turn into mud. The brain is, it becomes very stained, blackened. If you keep it pure, you keep restraining, you're learning not to get angry so easily, then what happened? It doesn't get angry so easily. Huh? It's just like that. Habits, habits, it's like riding bicycle. The more you do it, the better you are. At some point, you can slide down the slope and jump over obstacles if you do it often enough and haven't broken any bones <laughs> in the meantime. Okay? You will want to learn to live by the tenets of the teaching. Brahma Vihara, Karuna, compassion, Metta, friendliness, kindliness, Mudita, altruistic joy, and Upeka, equanimity. These are states of mind that can arise quite spontaneously if you're trying to be a good person. You learn not to get angry so easily, you learn to let go, you learn to smile at the world. The feeling of goodness will arise. Metta, friendliness, karuna, compassion, altruistic joy and equanimity. Let me explain a little. You see this word metta, and you may be more familiar with the translation as loving kindness, and I took that out of the way and call it friendliness. Actually, metta comes from the word mit, which is to be a friend. It is not so, it's at different levels, okay? It, metta, in the same way, karuna, metta, all these comes at different levels. You can have the metta of someone who is pretty new. To the, to the practice. So you're trying to be nice. You're trying to smile and not snare at the world. You're, so metta is just being friendly for at a very low level. When it's much more further developed, when you are truly a practitioner and you're not caught up with yourself anymore, then this metta becomes very strong. Because you're not caught up in the I, when you're not caught up in yourself, the metta, the friendliness, then becomes spontaneous. It doesn't have to be something you keep putting out and feeling you're depleted. Every time you pull out one metta, oh, no more already. <laughs> My bag of metta only got five. Five pieces of metta. It doesn't work like that, okay? When you start out, it's not easy. You know, may I be well and happy. May I, I, it doesn't work like that. It's going to be tough. Meta is... It's, it's, it's actually very easy to, to pop up if, if you are not caught up with yourself. Likewise for karuna, compassion. A lot of us have what I call conditional compassion. You suffering, I help you, I compassionate. You not suffering, I help you for what? Yes? Huh? Example, huh? you hear this story. The family is suffering. This, this, the, kid, the kid didn't have lunch. Huh? You just hear the story, the kid didn't have lunch. In fact, he hasn't been having lunch over the past few days. What happens? 
you feel very, very compassionate. You feel very generous. You're going to dig, out, dig into your pocket and you grab some money and you're going to buy lunch for the kid. Yes? You do it on the second day. You do it on the third day. On the fourth day, you say, why like that? Ah? <laughs> Taking me for granted. Ah. Then worse, you found out that the father's a gambler. And that, oh, this is bad. The kid is actually a naughty kid. He goes fight with people. Can you see your compassion diminishing by the, by the intel you got? So what we have very often is conditional compassion. The Buddha doesn't have that problem. He didn't have that problem. Remember, he chased after a serial killer. As I've always said, we always run the other direction when we know the fellow is a serial killer. But no, the Buddha went after him. Why? Because in the Buddha's understanding, the fellow will see Dhamma. He will help him. He will save this guy. We will be saying, he killed 999, no, took people's finger. What an awful man. We're not going to help him. He can rot. That's how we tend to react. Because ours, as I said, is conditional. Buddhas and the practitioners, the real practitioners, the real Arya, the, the Arahants, they are not conditional. Their compassion is not limited, illimitable. Okay? Mudita. Mudita. It is rejoicing with someone when he's enjoying something good, good fortune. Which is the reason why I didn't like sympathetic joy. Sympathetic implies he got into trouble. He had pain. Then you are happy. He had pain. <laughs> it doesn't, it's, not, it's wrong. It's, it doesn't make sense. A translation is a problem. Altruistic joy is not great translation, but it's the best that we have on the table. What it means is, he did well. He is enjoying good fortune. He's happy and you are happy for him, with him. And for us, this is difficult because of the I. This is difficult. Why is that? There is only one first prize. You got consolation. But if you have mudita, you would rejoice with him. Get it? Can you see how hmm, not so easy now it is? <laughs> I bought a car, he bought a bigger car. <laughs> okay, upeka. Upeka, for some people, is easy because they stop themselves from feeling. But upeka is not like that. It is not about not feeling. It is about seeing something and not getting attached to it. Not getting drawn into it. It's nothing to do with feelings. People think that being upeka means feeling neutral. Very neutral. Like a humming tone of a computer. It's not that. It means seeing something and not being dragged into it, get caught up by it, and therefore riding the emotions that come with whatever experiences. This is something to bear in mind. So you can be opaque and still care. That is why sometimes I've been asked this question, opaque means what? Nah? Indifference, not indifference. You care. But you're not caught up by the situation and your emotions are not running riots. Okay? If you are beginning to appreciate the Dhamma at a deeper level, this kind of sensations, this kind of um, state of mind will start to arise in you. Why? Because you're learning to moderate expectations, you're learning not to chase too hard, you're learning these little, little things. Buddha says, be grateful, you will say, I'm grateful. Buddha said, be giving, you will say, I will try to be giving. You know, you're just learning to do the right thing. And then when all these efforts are made, your mind will start to drift towards the positive side of the quadrant. 
it will start to drift in that direction. You become nicer. And therefore, these mental states will become more and more of a regularity in your mind. It doesn't just appear once a blue moon. Actually, not blue moon, the chewy jaco moon. It appears in the, in the full moon and the new moon, and then after that, the moon go, you also go. It doesn't happen like that. It will be there on a more regular basis as you try. Now, for many people, the intellect, meaning to say, understand the Dhamma intellectually, is not enough. You feel that you just don't know what it means. Lah. Meaning to say, I must remember I use big words. Meaning to say that you know, but yet you don't really know, you're not very sure. You have some idea what Dhamma is, you've read it many times, you have, went, you have gone through books after books, you have attended talks after talks, you have attended lectures after lectures. Guess what? You even have a PhD. <laughs> but still, the Dhamma, not really quite sure. I mean, you can write something, you can say a lot, but do you really know the Dhamma? You're not sure. You ever got the feeling? No, uh. You never have this feeling. <laughs> you all know, right? This kind of feeling. I know Dhamma, but I uh, don't know if I know, really, really know. Huh? That sort of feeling, okay. Because Dhamma, you can't really feel it. Oh, I love this kid. That's why I kept him. Really can't understand, can't really feel it. Now, this kind of sensations, this ambiguity, this confusion, this sense of I love the Dhamma, I don't know what I'm loving. <laughs> this kind of sensations, very normal. You think you are the only one in this room that feels this way? No. For 2,500 years, there were a lot of people who share your sentiments. And that's the reason why for New converts, for new converts, or even old followers who haven't seen the Dhamma, for many of us, we need something very tangible, something concrete. The result of which is, through the centuries, people have introduced concrete elements to try and cement faith, trigger, promote, cement faith. This is the reason why in all these years that have passed, and for the many years to come, as long as there are believers and followers, there will be new images of Buddha, beautiful images of Buddha, again and again. Now, Buddha's time, let's, let's do a little bit of history here. In Buddha's time, when Buddha was alive, already they introduced the idea of the Bodhi tree to represent the Dhamma. They didn't have a physical depiction of him, so we don't have an image of him in his time. At most, you have footprints, not his footprint, man-made footprints, uh, to suggest events of life, of his life, and so on and so forth. These are all man-made. Okay. Over time, they all got more and more elaborate. As I said, the earliest was the Bodhi tree being a symbol of Dhamma. And then over time, they built faces, symbols for inspirations to depict him. Okay? Very normal. So one set to anchor faith, one set of things that were going on were the art pieces including literary works. You know, your stories about the life of the Buddha, all the proliferation of tales, some of which I kept saying, they were not original. They came on much later. Read the book. No, the book. Just read the book. A lot of which was introduced, were introduced much later, okay? But there's another thing that's going on and this is something to, just, just for knowledge, chantings, 
We all chant, right? You don't chant. You should chant once in a while. There are two types, okay? Originally, there were a set of chantings. You know, your suttas. There's a whole bunch of suttas. Mangala Sutta, Ratana Sutta, Parbawa Suttas, all these suttas. Ratana Sutta, the long, long one on the triple gems. Originally, these suttas were meant to memorize Buddha's teaching. Later on, through the centuries, people start to take these chantings, these suttas, and make them into a declaration of faith. Even something like Iti Piso Bhagawa Rahan Sama Sambuddho Vijancharana Sambuddho, that, that, that homage to Buddha, homage to Dharma, homage to Sangha, originally they were meant to say, reminder, what he was, what he stood for, what Dharma was, what Dhamma, what, how Dhamma is to be understood. Then today, what do we do? We use them for blessings. <laughs> for our declaration of faith. Our declaration of faith, right? You do that because your, your way of saying that I believe in you, I believe in you. You have no idea what you're saying, but I believe in you. Okay? Oh, sorry. This is the other one. So one set is about teaching. The other set is about him, who he was, what he stood for. But all now, now we use them all for building faith. In fact, over time, we became so good at it, we have very elaborate rituals. We are so good at coming up with details. And we even use, and we tell ourselves, many a times when you ask people, why are we doing this? They will say, uh, it's important, it must be done. And you must do it this way and not that way and it has to be this way and you'll count to three and then you do this. A lot of details. When they were first introduced, I am very sure when some of these rituals, when they were first introduced, it was probably introduced by a teacher who knew what he was doing. And it was likely that when they were first introduced, it was meant to build faith and to develop mindfulness when they were first introduced. But over time, people caught up with the form, the style, the form, the sequence, and they forgot the part about the mind. So they're called the body, and they forgot the mind. So you bow in this way. Why? Because it must be like that. None of these were practiced in the Buddha's time. Let me give you a... Uh, just share some thoughts about Buddha's uh, period. You know, if you go into the sutta, you read the sutta, you'll find that when people went to visit the Buddha, they actually didn't bow, some of them. In fact, most of them didn't bow. They would just walk up to him and say, Yo, bro. <laughs> okay, maybe not yo, bro. Lah. They would go up to him and they say, Sometimes they say, Bante. Sometimes they say, uh, Ascetic Gotama, they call him by names. By his name, Ascetic Gotama. We have a question for you, they will say. No making appointment through Ananda. No only make appointment. He comes out of his heart. In fact, in fact, he was so informal. They, when people went to visit him and he was in his kuti, his own uh, heart, the monks, they don't ring fans his heart. Huh? You just go up to here and say, uh, excuse me, can you just point me to the Buddha's heart? And then they'll say, uh, that one, uh, that one, then, uh, you just go there. And then they'll tell you what to do. They'll say, you go there. You don't just go in and chong in, uh, so rude, right? You go there and you do this. <coughs> you read the sutta. You think I'm creating stories. You just read the sutta, he said. You go up there and you clear your throat. <coughs> Why? Give him early warning someone's at the door. Then you knock, and he will come out. You don't charge in, he will come out. Maybe because the kuti was very small. Enough space for Buddha to sit and meditate. Then you chow in, and who's going to stand where? We don't know, okay? We don't know how big or small it was. But this was what they said. What does it tell you? Got ritual, ah. Got mudras and rituals and bow in a certain way. Don't have. 
Just go in. Hi, sorry, Buddha. Sorry to interrupt you. I've got a question for you. Is that okay? And Buddha said, come, come, come. Ask your question. Wasn't that nice? Okay, so that was one way of visiting. And then another way when a crowd visit, they come by the horde. Hundreds of people descending on the monastery to visit Buddha. And then they will tell you, this is what happened. Some of them will go before him and bow. You can know straight away, those must be his disciples. Then some of them will just stand down there, put their hands together in jali position, and then just go bow their head. Hi, I'm so and so from Ang Mokyo. <laughs> and, okay. and then you will have some who will not just not say a word. They just look at him like he is some uh, top person of interest, and then they just stand by the side and watch. And those are the ones who are just observers. Probably non-believer, but they are curious about him. Everybody knows him, so they also want to know him. That's all. You can see there was no rules to conduct, how to conduct yourself in Buddha's time. So it's very strange that in his time, no rules, but in our time, got rules. <laughs> it's very strange, isn't it? No pujas. Offering is into his bowl. Oh, I say, no dressing requirements. And this is the truth. All kinds of people, there were people who were uh, sharing clothes when they went to see him. That was in the suttas or so. Very poor, only got one set. 